Okay, now we're going to talk about plant diversity, chapters 29 and 30 in the textbook. And here is our look at all of the eukaryotes. We're up here with land plants, these organisms that are closely related to the green algaes, the, this type of protist. And um, plants and algae share many characteristics. Of course, photosynthesis being one of the most important things. There's a particular um, algae and particular, these ones known as the Caraphysians, that are the closest relatives to land plants. And these are some of the characteristics that plants and Caraphysians share, a particular structure that produces their cellulose, their peroxisomes, these organelles that break down hydrogen peroxide, share particular enzymes. The structure of their flagella and their sperm cells is very similar. And they both produce this structure called a phragmoplast, which is used to rebuild the cell wall after cell division. Again, these are shared by plants and these types of protists known as caraphysians. Also, um, the molecular similarities exist between plants and the caraphysians as well. So here are all the plants, the uh, non-vascular plants, typically called the mosses, although there are other kinds. The vascular plants, which include ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. And within them, you, the ferns are the non-seed plants. And the gymnosperms and angiosperms have seeds. And as we'll see, the flowering plants have developed or evolved fruits and flowers that are unique to them. OK, so what? basically um, makes a plant a plant. We'll go through these. We'll see that plants basically help to uh, lead the invasion of land long ago and having certain uh, characteristics helped in doing this. All plants have an apical meristem at the tips of their roots, roots and shoots. They have these clusters of cells that are actively going through cell division to cause the plant to grow to get larger an apical meristem. They have alternation of generations, which is when an organism has a multicellular haploid stage, known as the gametophyte, and a multicellular diploid stage, known as the sporophyte. The job of the sporophyte is to produce spores, which are haploid, and go through mitotic events to produce the multicellular gametophyte. The job of the gametophyte is to produce gametes, and the gametes from different gametophytes will get together and through fertilization to produce the diploid stage of the next stage of the plant, the next sporophyte stage. So plants have uh, sporangia, these structures whose job is to produce spores. Gametangia, a structure whose job is to produce gametes. Embryos that are growing on the plant and are dependent upon that plant. So here's our types again. Um, you can see the number of species each type. You don't have to remember that by any means, but just note how the most recently evolved group of plants, the angiosperms, are the most uh, diverse group. And as you'll see, the group that we as that humans most depend on. Here's the tree again. You can see the time frame in which this is happening. Again, origin of land plants almost 500 million years ago. Vascular plants 420 million years ago. Seed plants about 360 million years ago. So the bryophytes, um, moss again being an example. We see here, here's the gametophyte stage, which in mosses is the largest dominant stage. Again, it's haploid, multicellular haploid. You have separate male and female gametophytes. The males have a structure, a gametangia, basically known as the antheridia that produces the male gametes, and the females have an archegonia that produces the eggs. They have flagellated sperm that rely on there being water around to swim over to the female part, the female plant. Rain can splash these uh, sperm cells around to the female parts. Once you get there, you get fertilization, formation of the sporophyte, and in mosses, the sporophyte grows off of and is dependent on the gametophyte. We'll see that's different in the other plants. 
mosses, relatively small plants, most bryophytes, relatively small plants growing low to the ground where it's relatively wet. Here we can see some of these sporophytes growing off of the gametophyte, and here in moss as well. These are the gametophytes down here, the green structures, and the sporophytes are coming off of the top of the gametophytes. Mosses play a critical role, particularly in more northern climates where it's colder and relatively wet, um, forming these vast uh, deposits of what is called peat moss, or this particular species known as sphagnum. These deposits store a lot of carbon um, and have done this over millennia, thousands if not millions of years. And um, we tap into these peat moss beds when we want to get peat moss out for our gardens. And back in the day up in Northern Europe, Ireland, Asia, they used to take some of the peat moss, dry it out, and then they could use that as a source of fuel because once it's dry, it'll burn. Okay, um, so now we get into the vascular plants. The next important evolutionary step is the development of vascular tissue, which allows plants to get larger. But at this point, we still do not have seed plants. The ferns, again, do not have seeds. Way back in the day, the ferns plants formed these large forests with these really large trees. And at that time, that's when you got sort of the first Earth's forest forming. And... Um, Let's see. So here's a typical fern life cycle. You have, again, the multicellular haploid gametophyte, which is this independent structure that's relatively small and grows on the ground. In ferns, you have a gametophyte that produces both the male and female parts, unlike the moss, which had separate male and female gametophytes. Here it's on the same one. Again, antheridia producing the flagellated sperm, archegonia producing the egg. The sperm have to swim over to the female part have to have moisture around to do that. The sporophyte, after fertilization, begins growing off of the gametophyte and then eventually becomes an independent structure. So vascular tissue allowing plants to be able to efficiently move water around in the case of xylem and the products of photosynthesis around in the case of the phloem allowing, allowing the plant to get larger. We'll discuss this a bit more when we talk about form and function of plants. And now that we have vascular tissue, we have what we call true roots and true leaves. That is, structures known as roots and leaves have vascular tissue in them. So basically, mosses don't really officially have roots and leaves. So now, <clears throat> reproduction um, in ferns, gymnosperms, and angiosperms, you have structures called sporophylls, which are leaves that are modified to produce these structures called sporangia, which produce spores. In the case of a fern, they are um, homosporous. They have a sporophyte, which produces a single type of spore, and that gametophyte, which has the, both the male and the female parts, the antheridia that produce the sperm cells and the archegonia that produce the eggs. But as we'll see when we get to gymnosperms and angiosperms, they're known as heterosporous. They have um, megaspores and microspores, and the megaspores produce the eggs, and the microspores produce the sperm cells. So now, next major evolutionary adaptation, the production of the seed. And so, um, oh, I messed up again, I'm sorry. We do not have the seed at this point. These are still the vascular plants that do not have seeds. So again, these are the ancestors to today's ferns that produce these vast forests that at that time took up a lot of carbon dioxide and stored it. And once these forests um, began to decay and become buried, they basically turned into what are the coal deposits that we now use as part of the modern society and beginning with the Industrial Revolution. All right, and an image of those forests. Again, no gymnosperms and angiosperms. These are just some of those ancient types of bryophytes. All right, now we get to the next step, the seed, the seed plants, the gymnosperms and angiosperms. So they are now the dominant types of plants on the planet, particularly the angiosperms, although there are vast forests of gymnosperms, particularly when you go further north. All right. <clears throat> 
So all seed plants, um, they have a reduced gametophyte that lives on the sporophyte, as we'll see, as opposed to, again, remember, mosses, the sporophyte lived on the dominant gametophyte. Heterosporous, as we just talked about, and they have production of ovules and pollen grain. Ovules are the structures that contain the female gametophyte, and pollen grains are structures that contain the male gametophyte. So here's to remind us again, for mosses with the dominant gametophyte, ferns with the dominant sporophyte that grows off the gametophyte, and gymnosperms and angiosperms that have the dominant sporophyte in which the gametophyte grows on it. So there's an interesting trend in the evolution of plants. Ovule, female gamete, produces the megaspore and the eggs, and the ovules, once fertilization has occurred, you get the embryo developing in there, and each ovule develops into a seed. The male gametes produced by the microspores, uh, which develop into the pollen grains, um, all over the body of this uh, bee here, uh, carrying out pollination, which is the transfer of the pollen from the female to the female part of the plant. So now these plants are not dependent on water for fertilization. They use the wind or animals for that to happen. Here's a close-up of a pollen grain. They have these interesting looks and shapes to them. Seeds, so now the job here is um, of a seed is to contain that embryo and to be dispersed one way or another and find an advantageous location to germinate and begin growing. You can see here the root has come out and then the shoot is heading up. Okay, gymnosperms. These are known as the naked seed plants because they do not have their seeds contained within a fruit like the angiosperms. They produce cones. Not all, all of them have what we look to us like cones, but they are cones. For example, these junipers have sort of a fleshy cone. Whereas here, pine trees contain what we typically think of as your cone that you see on a gymnosperm. But they have a couple different kinds of cones. The ones we often see are the female cones, the ones that produce the seeds, and they're larger, but there are also these male cones whose job is to produce the pollen grains. So the life cycle of your typical uh, gymnosperm, or conifer in this case, a pine tree. So you've got the female cone that produces the ovules, the male cone that produces the pollen. And you get uh, typically, well, most exclusively with uh, gymnosperms, you find wind pollination. And so the wind blows the pollen over to the female cones, where you get fertilization. Um, production of the next generation, the next sporophyte generation. The seeds are produced on that female cone, they disperse, and you've got the next plant, the sporophyte, which will then produce the next set of cones, etc., etc. Again, these guys have alternation of generation because there's both a multicellular haploid and multicellular diploid stage. Angiosperms, why don't we stop the video right now and I'll pick up here in a second.